That's the way it is. So, Lord, whatever this you want to go through, great. And whatever not, fine. <laughs> yeah? You done? You ready? Okay. We'll try to... I, we've had all these technical little challenges, so I'm going to have to push buttons here, which would be a little bit strange for me to talk that way because you think I was Italian. I have to talk with my hands. But anyway, okay, we'll go with this. So, by the way, welcome into a new month. You're in a new month of Av. Okay? Yeah. You got that? Fifth biblical month. So one of the questions often people ask is, where are we, right? But more often here we ask, well, it's more a matter of when are we? When in time are we? Because time is different with God's concept of it than ours, right? God is outside of time, but he intersects us with time. But he wants us to align our time with his. No, no, God, I'm too busy right now. I can't do that. Tonight, our time got shifted. You saw that, right? And it's okay. And so we can adjust or we can just blaze on with our time and then we miss what God has. Similarly, we believe that every time we come up in his time and we're now in the fifth biblical month called Av and uh, there's about 10 references to the fifth month. It's aligned with the tribe of Simeon. There's even more than that. And we just kind of pull those down. But what I want to do is give you another quick time concept because we've been talking about being in the straits, right? Or otherwise called the narrows. And what is that? It's in the fourth month, biblical month, which is Tammuz, right? You come to the end of Tammuz. Are you glad to be through Tammuz? Okay. Big theme of that was what? Was what? The calf, but specifically not the calf. Where does it translate into you? Counterfeit gods and idols, right? getting down into those deep level. How many of you have been working on that? Okay. Do not just walk away. There's deeper work, right? He doesn't bring us into revelation to then just have you forget about it. It's like, okay, continue to walk with me because what you see in this month is idolatry flares its ugly head. Once again, a counterfeit God. What are we looking for? But the fourth month is Tammuz and the fifth month is Av. And if you're wondering just why these things are so intense here, between the 17th of Tammuz and the 5th of Av, these things happen in what they call the Narrows. Of course, you have the golden calf on one side, and on the 9th of Av, the refusal at Kadesh Barnea. We're going to talk about that, right? When Israel was already and should have just marched right in and instead refused. So, of course, at Sinai, 3,000 die, and then over time, you see all this other fallout. Biblically, it's when the starvation in Jerusalem started. It's when Nebuchadnezzar breached the wall. It's also when Zedekiah released judgment. The second uh, Jerusalem wall was breached later on by the Romans. The Romans burned the Torah and they placed an idol in the temple. That all happened in those last couple of weeks in Tammuz. And then when you go over to Av, of course, years later, Aaron dies. Of course, we're going to talk about Tendai, the day that the refusal. But Aaron dies later. The first temple is actually destroyed. The second temple, once it's rebuilt, when Nehemiah and and company that's destroyed in the same time the romans plow jerusalem with salt so nothing can grow the first crusade is declared and out of that you just see millions of jews that are are slaughtered spain expels all jews years later world war one is declared and russia mobilizes for world war one and the persecution of jews ensues and you even see the deportation of the warsaw ghetto kind of heavy duty huh yeah, this is between this between these two times, the narrows and that month. But see, for us, this is about like remember the old game show Truth or Consequences? Yeah, okay. There are consequences to actions. And so Israel walks in rebellion and there were consequences then and there's stuff that continues to fall out over time. But we know that if you if you fully repent, right, you can break the cycle of that curse coming around. I won't get into all that right now, but suffice to say, right, you get the narrows. How many of you feel like you've been going through a bit of a narrows? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody like, okay, yeah. Well, I want to give you another bit of encouragement, though, because there's this three-week period of time of mourning if you're a, a traditional Jew. And mentioned before, they won't get married, have a major court decision, anything like that, because it's just considered a kind of an ominous time. But once you get through the ninth of Av and you get through the three weeks, then there's something else that they call the Menachem Av because it marks a turning point then. 
It marks a turning point because time looks forward and from the ninth of Av, there's seven weeks until Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. You remember what that is? That's when the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, right? So you go through this rough time, but then there's a pivot towards it, okay? You have to hold both of those in this month. So... Menachem Av is the comfort of Av, and what that really is, Av in the Aramaic is Abba, which means the comfort of the Father. Right? Do you need the comfort of the Father? Okay, particularly when you're going through press times, right? Stuff that's working its way out. And so let me give you this too. Comfort, yes, comfort my people. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her, her that her warfare has ended that her iniquity is pardoned. She has received in the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Yeah, good verse, okay. There's speaking that, speaking over Jerusalem, speaking over his people. So I want to make a quick change here. How many, can you see that from all the way back there, Farron? Can you see what that is? What is it? Okay, let's scan up a little bit so you can see more of this. I love this photography. You got a baby, and then who else? Mom and dad. Okay, good. Now, how about this one? Who's there? What do you see? What? Man and a woman. Okay, nice photograph. What about this one? Okay, children, right? Now, see, the issue about perception is a lot of time about what you're focused upon. So I showed you this, right? But let me ask you if it changes, if I zoom you back a little bit and I take you to this. Squint your eyes so you see only the white. It's a dog. Can you see him? Can you see the dog? Okay. Yeah. Just squint, just squint your eyes so you could only just really see the light. But see, how many of you are not able to see it yet? Okay, okay. Don't worry, just, just squint, squint. Squint your eyes out at it, right? Now all you can see is the dog, right? Yeah, okay. See, it depends a lot on what you're looking for, right? What you perceive. Now, again, remember this one? Okay, let me zoom you back. Now what do you see? There you go, a cat, right? Okay. And you saw this one, right? Can you? Here you go. Rabbit. Aren't those amazing? Okay. These were actually done by an ad agency um, for Mumbai. They were doing a, they wanted a campaign for adopting a pet. And so they did these graphics for that. And, um, but I was so intrigued by that because it's about perception, right? And that's critical in this month because what we perceive is real important with all the things that are going on, right? Fake news happens to be out in there. Definition of fake news, it's a noun. False news stories, often of a sensational nature, created to be widely shared or distributed for the purpose of generating revenue or promoting or discrediting a public figure, political movement, company, etc. Okay? Now, what it also is, is it applies to a lot of different things, but it's going to apply to this way. How, what we perceive, then we proceed. Okay, here's, here's the issue. And it's going to tie right into this month because Israel is going to recon, report, and react to news. And some of it is fake news. And so it's fake news in the month of off, right? Are you, hello? Okay. I don't set up God's calendar. He lands these things in it, but then when he does, I use that to pay attention and say, okay, what, what do I need to pay attention to? And the graphic I sent for you had a, a guy looking through this newspaper that was on fire, right? And the, the statement was, can you see through the report? Because our ability to see through all the various reports that are going down is very, very critical in this time. And it's what Israel failed to do. You get this. 
All these things happen to them, it says in 1 Corinthians, for our benefit, so that we would be educated. Yeah? Okay, so a little bit of I spy. How many of you read the ping and read the scriptures? Okay, good, most of you. You didn't? Too bad? And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man. Everyone a what? A leader. Everyone a leader. Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. Good idea or bad idea to spy out the land? Good idea. Why a good idea? Power. Knowledge is power? Okay, Sun Tzu, yeah, you got to have intel on it, right? Okay, but here's the question, though. Had God told them anything about the land? Milk and honey, had he, had he promised anything else about the land? He didn't say giants, but pardon me? He was going to give it to them. So you show up. I've got this big wrapped present that's waiting for you, and I promised I was going to give it to you. You go, can I look at it first? Can I, I'm not sure, you know, I want to do a little intel, make sure it's, you know, I don't want to be embarrassed to open it up. And Hello? Okay. So how did this happen? Just so you know, there's another account of these things, and they actually, some would say they contradict, but they actually give us a more complete picture. This is in the first chapter of Deuteronomy. We reached Kadesh Barnea, this is Moses narrating. Then I said to you, you have reached the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, told you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Is that clear cut? Is there any mention about spying out the land? Okay, so this happens. Then all of you came to me and said, let us send men ahead to spy out the land for us and bring back a report about the route we are to take and the towns we will come to. Sound reasonable, right? Now, here's a chance where Moses would have said, uh, back up dudes, what did I just tell you? Go take it, he promised to you, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. But the challenge is with leadership. The idea seemed good to me, so I selected 12 of you, one man from each tribe. So now you're getting the full story. God had never said to do the recon. God had done the recon. God had said, I'm going to give it into your hands. In fact, I'm sending an angel before you to drive out. And he said, you know, they're going to be mightier than you. There's seven, right? Seven ites that are greater than you. But I'm going to take care of them. It's not like they didn't know that. So it sounds pretty good. But well, what happens then, they get this committee together, and then God says, okay, that's what you want to do? Go send spies. Good idea or bad idea to send spies? Okay, oh, now you've changed your mind. Oh, just like Israel, okay. Well, the reality is it's, we don't know until we have direction. So I need you to get this because if you think this isn't going to be a month where you're going to be faced with some decisions about going forward on the word of the Lord or not, please slap yourself. You know? Get over it, okay? There will be things because God doesn't set up his word and release it for him to return for it to return to void. And he has us look at these things because there's things coming and there's things we got to get in this month because there's more coming. The times we have never been this way before, it is absolutely nobody knows for sure what's next in the natural, right? Talking with folks about going back to school and stuff like that. When school's starting, not starting, is it virtual? Is it real? What? We don't know. So we're going to have to walk very carefully with the Lord. Now, let me give you something. Alexander McLaren was, is one of my favorites to read. He was called a nonconformist, okay, which I like already, pastor. <laughs> Back in the days of the, uh, the late uh, 19th century. And uh, 
anyway, he's been one of my favorites to go and look at some of his commentary on this. And so there's, throughout the night, I want to season it with some of the things he said. It's a bad sign when unbelief sends out sense to be its scout. And when we think to verify God's words by men's confirmation, not to believe him unless a jury of 12 of ourselves says the same thing is surely much the same as not believing him at all. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't pull any punches. These cowards were no monsters, but average men who did very much what average men professing to be Christians do every day and for doing get praised for prudence by other average professing Christians. Are you understanding that? This one will make it more sense. How many of us, when brought right up to some task involving difficulty or danger, but unmistakably laid on us by God, shelter our distrustful fears under the fair pretext of knowing a little bit more about it first? Hello? So I'm just, I'm just perking up the word based in time for now, for us, okay? The difference between a majority report and a minority report, right? Doesn't mean the minority report's wrong or that it's right. Question is not either one. Are we looking for someone to, to confirm what God has already said? Sometimes you need to get confirmation, but sometimes it's just an excuse. I like what he said. These cowards were no monsters, but average men and women. Although it would have been interesting if they sent 11 men and one woman. I'm wondering what would have happened. <laughs> Never know. So the report. And this is how reports will often go. Those of you who read this know what it says. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, one of the most dangerous words. Nevertheless. You know the rest of it, right? The people who dwell in the land are strong. Number two, the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Anak were giants. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. So often, a report will be given to you. By the way, were any of those things untrue? No, but it's how it's positioned. Well, yeah, of course this is right, but you make up your own mind. Hello, right? It's how a report usually goes. Well, yeah, that's true, but yeah, no, hello. And if you think that's just out there and that you don't play that game in your own mind, just come on. Snap out of it. Could have had a V8. No. Okay. Truly the eye sees what it brings with it. This is from McLaren. They really had gone to look for dangers, and of course they found them. Okay. How you perceive is usually then how you will proceed. Yeah? So to do another phrase here, if you've got lenses that are looking for bad news, guess what? You will find it. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's true of this, that believing is seeing, not seeing is believing, right? Because your structure, your decision, your filters, what are you looking at? What are you looking for? ultimately filters in usually anything that you see. You did not see those animals in those pictures the first time. And they were there. They were all there. Okay? But it's only when you believed, then you could see it, right? When we pointed it out, then you could see it and go from there. And then, of course, the response to any of that 
twofold. You got Caleb's response. Caleb quieted the people before Moses said, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. Right? I don't know if Joshua was an exhorter wiring or if he was a prophet perceiver. But but he's just right there, right? Just got to love him. What's interesting, does he mention anything of God in that? He doesn't. But he is convinced, right? There is something in what he has seen, in the way in which he's seen what he has seen, that convinces him. And, and he just, he's ready to go. He's just like, right? He is, he is just chomping at the bit. Of course, that's one half of it, and the other half is there. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Was that true? Okay, well... They are stronger than we is true. See, again, and if, with a report, you're going to find that little bit of truth and then this, this other premise, right? What, what are you pulling with it? And again, well, you know, God, I really would like to do that. I really, maybe, but maybe I'm just not hearing you, right? I hate this type of lesson. <laughs> I'm sorry, because it's like, oh, God. Because I have to, I have to walk it out too, right? And then when there is this, now what happens is there's a response to the report, which means there's another report. But now it gets really interesting. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, "The land through which we have gone as spies." is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak come from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Right? Just, just starts to spin. Oh, it's, it's really, right? Just magnifies more and more. You never have that issue though, right? So perceiving, a couple of comments from McLaren. To begin a perilous enterprise without fairly facing its risks and difficulties is folly. Let's make real clear, right? We go back again to grace and truth, right? First chapter in John, twice it talks about Jesus full of grace and truth. And here we've talked repetitively about that being like a live wire. You've got to hold both ends for the current go through you. You never back down from the truth. Denial is not faith. Okay, you have to look clearly at it. Yeah, they're big ass guys. But, right? So to go without understanding, Jesus says you can't, no one's going to wage war without first seeing if he needs to sue for peace, right? No man starts a tower without figuring out if he's got enough to finish it. You don't put your hand to the plow and then look back. And your, your furrow is going to go off. But to look at them, those are the risks, only is no less folly and is the sure precursor of defeat. So we have to look at the giants, right? You've got to look at the reality of what it is. You don't back away from, you know what? That really sucks. The doctor said this. My bank account says this. Okay, that's just what it is. But I'm not going to look only at that. Because if I look only at that, that's folly, and it's going to guarantee pretty much defeat. I'm telling you stuff you already know, right? No? Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's it's... But we have to be reminded, part of you go like, yeah, I, I, do, I do know that. But it's a time when God brings it back up because we're going to square off with things where we need to know this. Just the way it is. You know, it's Jesus and Lazarus getting the word about Lazarus and then waiting and then saying, okay, let's go wake Lazarus up. Oh, well, if he's sleeping, he'll get better. And he says, he's dead. Right? I mean, just, guys, we got to, he's dead? What? Right? You just, you got, 
well, then why did you, you think Mary and Martha peppered him with questions. What do you think the disciples were doing? Okay, I am so confused. We could have gone there earlier. You could have healed him. What's going, well, it's for my glory. Okay, we're at that point again, huh? What does that possibly mean? What's he, they didn't have a premise, for, right? But we have to look at all of it. So then there's a proceeding. From the perception comes a process. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. How many people are weeping now? A couple of million, probably. 600,000 fighting men numbered off in the census. Which, by the way, is not a small troop. If you're going to go up and do wage war, don't you think having a, an army of 600,000 has got to appeal something kind of like, you know? Okay. That report came back, and boy, just... <laughs> And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Wouldn't, not, wouldn't it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt, right? Is this kind of stunning? They've been out in the wilderness now, just so we're clear, for about a year and a half, okay? The temple, the tabernacle's been made. They've seen phenomenal things. God's been providing manna, everything else, right? It's not like they've had that long to forget what they were under back in Egypt. How well do you think it's going to go if they go back to Egypt? Pharaoh's going to say with open arms, Oh, beloved children, come back. For the banquet I have prepared for you. <laughs> Terror is more contagious than courage, for a mob is always more prone to base than to noble instincts. In the face of disappointment, yeah, you're seeing it. You're watching this walk out. Again, what do you perceive directs how you proceed, right? It's just, it's just the way it works. But you're going to have to fight to be able to see well. The other thing I love about that is the first thing they do is decide they're going to be a democracy. <laughs> Let's choose somebody. Oh, that always works out well. Let's have an election. This Moses guy didn't work out so well, right? I mean, come on. But the other thing that just gets me is that they move first. The blame goes first where? To Moses and Aaron. Pretty typical. We'll go after leaders. But then what we do is then they sh shift it to actually accusing God. Why did the Lord bring us out? So you got to see God on the sidelines who is waiting now to enter into the scene, which he's going to do fairly soon, right? It says later, those of you read, right? I'm giving away the, what happens. The glory appears, but he waits for a few things to get perked out. But so not only are they dissing the promise, his ability to perceive it and everything else, but now they've completely flipped it. Why did God bring us out here to kill us with the sword? Have you ever been in a pity party like that? How many of you are willing to admit it? You have. <laughs> okay. Oh, God, why me? Right. Okay. It's just, it's the way we, you know, if you think this all just happens in groups, it happens right in the committee right here. How many of you know you have a committee in your mind? You know, all these different voices going on sometimes, and boy, they get really nasty sometimes. You may not fess up to God, but part of you is like, you know, sucker, 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 sucker. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephthun, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. 
Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Man, you might want to print this out somewhere and just put it on your refrigerator, next to your computer screen. Put it on the, tape it on the corner of your TV, wherever you happen to take an occasional taste of the, of the news. The news, right? You have, to, you have to find a way through there. But I love that there's no presumption in this, right? If the Lord, what? Delights in us. There's not like, you know what? It's just, they're not presumptuous about this. They understand it's a relationship. There's a favor. There's a staying connected to the Father. If we go out and try to do this ourselves, we're toast. Okay? But he'll bring us into the land. Only do not rebel. See, these two were very, very clear. This is out and out rebellion. This is not just a disagreement. This is complete rebellion. What happens in a rebellion is you try to overthrow the, the ruler, right? The leader. Well, they were walking that out already, accusing Moses and Aaron, accusing God, and then saying, okay, let's just go back. But I love this, for they are our bread. <laughs> Beyond the perception of a challenge, they're seeing this as opportunity, right? Oh man, that big one, bread, right? Can, what does it take to have that kind of spirit in the midst of it that's not based in denial, okay? That is not faith. Brass tacks, what is? I see you're 10 feet tall, 500 pounds, whatever. Think of David and Goliath, but they didn't have David and Goliath to look to. This is quite a bit before David, right? But that same mentality. And one of the comments that McLaren said is that faith, when it runs towards the object of fear, finds that the fear actually gets smaller. Where when you're operating just in your senses, as you get closer, it gets bigger. Make sense? How many of you have been really afraid of something, but the buildup of it was the worst part? And then when you actually got to that point and crossed over, it was like, okay, right? But you, you lived in dread for weeks or months. Oh, God, if I say that, if I go through this, if I make this decision, it's going to, this could, that could, you do. no? Okay, just me. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. The clarity, Caleb. So, I tried to find a movie clip, and so I, I, go, I just Googled the, you know, quote, what are you looking at, right? It came up with a list of about 500 movies <laughs> where that was a line somewhere in the movie. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? What are you looking at? Whatever. So let me give you some more of McLaren. These two had seen all that the others had, but everything depends on the eyes which look. The others had measured themselves against the trained soldiers and giants and were in despair. These two measured Amalekites and Anax against God and were jubilant. <laughs> they do not dispute the facts but they reverse the implied conclusion because they add the governing fact of God's help. Ah, great, some, just some great lines in here, so I could try to slice and dice them, just give you some version of it, but I like his. These two measured the Amalekites and the Anex against God and were jubilant versus the others that were in despair. So, consequences. Now, the Lord, right, appears. I've, I'm just skipping over a little bit, right? His glory appears. <laughs> and he's ready to toast them. And so Moses has to jump in once more, intervene. He says, God, you don't want to do that. 
because reputation, your reputation, the word's going to get on the street. They're going to say, well, he couldn't bring him in, so therefore he killed him. So don't, don't do that. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. He's saying this to Moses. But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Right there, just stop. I've pardoned him, but you know what? My glory isn't going to get diminished from this stupidity. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and, you see all the ands here? Seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and those in the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. Is this at all true of believers today? You know, years ago, it became very clear to me that, that as the institutional church, we'd gotten pretty clear on the fact of being pulled out of Egypt, right? That we were free from our sin, but then that we just simply got stuck wandering the wilderness because we were never willing to conquer because Jordan was seen as crossing the river Jordan was death. Well, I'm sorry, but going into heaven, there are no Amalekites there, no Canaanites there. You don't have to fight. You don't have to take that land. It's, it's done, done. So clearly there was more for the body of Jesus to do, and yet too often we just wander around the same place, and we don't get to see the land which God has sworn. But then there's this, course, caveat. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him, and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. You know all these texts, right? Here's the issue that's so strange. The question about obedience or disobedience. They were looking with great fear of if they crossed over and had to go to war with the giants, right? And they were afraid they would get slaughtered and their wives and children would be taken. So instead, they elect to go back to Egypt. The most prudent self-love would coincide with the most self-sacrificing heroic concentration, consecration. In other words, if you get clear about the opportunity that actually is before you, even if it's just because you want what's best for you, you getting this, will be the most self-sacrificing heroic consecration into the mission of God. You're not following. Okay, let me get the rest of this. A man seeks escape from the dangers and toil of enlisting in God's army by running back through the desert to put his, put his neck in chains in Egypt. Do you understand that what they're saying is, okay, we're not going to take that risk. Instead, we're going to go back and just get locked in chains again. Fear, okay? And that fear is becomes an idol, becomes, okay, and we're going to serve our sense and everything else. So, Christy, what this is, is indicating is that when we have a challenge of something we need to step into, you know that God's told you step into that. We always want to do a cost-benefit analysis, okay? I was a businessman for many years, 25 years. And you do cost-benefit analysis. How much is it going to cost you? What's the benefit? Okay? And if you don't, the risk-reward involved. What he's saying by this is that the risk of not going over and what's going to happen is you're going to fall back into bondage under the chain is far worse than any risk you're going to face by advancing. It costs you more to not advance than to stay safe. Staying safe is the truly dangerous thing because you're not stepping in because the risks staying back are greater. And that's what he's saying, the most prudent self-love. God, I don't get this. It feels scary. I'm going to, you know, 
what he's trying to say is it's better for you to go forward in what seems like self-sacrificing heroic consecration. I'm consecrating myself. I'm self-sacrificing myself. Yeah, you're going to... Jesus says that if you do not pick up your cross daily, yeah, you have to die daily. If you don't die, you will gain the world, but you'll forfeit your soul. Oh, it's going to cost me more not to die. It's going to cost me more not to die, not to take the risk. That, to me, feels very, very critical with whatever each of us is facing now, and that hesitancy. But what if, you know, the, is there risk? Absolutely. What's interesting here, I raise this up. Can you see down here? Johnson Blaze's own trail. I didn't make that up. It was just kind of like one of the things. I went, oh, that's kind of interesting, clearly. But let's not make that about me. Let's make it about Caleb Blaze's own trail. Was that true based on what you saw up there, what you heard? Okay. So we just want to look at him for a minute. Caleb, his name actually means dog. Okay. Robert Heidler likes to call him Mad Dog because he's just like, and it's why I picked up this picture of this dog. I could not find, I couldn't get a picture of what I thought was kind of a wimpy looking dog. I needed a dog that looks like he was ready for a fight. But also one who is incredibly loyal. Right? He's standing with a master. He's got it. And what God says of him, he has a different spirit in him, and he has followed me fully. you got to get that in the craziness of Av and in the refusal, there's this character of Caleb who sits there speaking to each of us. And he's from the tribe of Judah, yeah. And there's something about that, and it's called down here, it's a ruach achir. It's, it's a spirit that's different. And now you might want to jump and go, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. Well, not, not actually what this text says, just so we're clear. The different spirit means there's a different kind of mindset. There's a different focus. He's, he's got this thing like that dog who's both ready. Don't, doesn't that dog look like if he, you challenged his master? He, he, okay. And you can hear it in Caleb when he's saying, there are bread, man. You want to go get that guy? Yeah. And we see it later. We see it 40 years later, right, when he's 85, and he's going in. By the way, another way to interpret his name is all heart. Because Caleb, Leb is heart. And so you don't find that translation as often, but it's another way. And I think that's probably a pretty good way to see him. But here's what he says 40 years later. Now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain. Do you know the mountain that he wants? The mountain that he wants is where the giants had dominion. The very ones that everybody was so afraid of, they weren't everywhere, but they were on there. They were there up on Hebron, and he says, that's what I want. That's what I want. The biggest, baddest challenge has the biggest, greatest reward. That's mine. That's my bread. That's my inheritance. And he waited 45 years for it, right? So you get the, you get this. Okay, so part of what God's trying to infuse in us in the midst of that craziness, when you see that, is that different spirit of Caleb. Yeah? which is available because we're linked in through the tribe of Judah and the lion of the tribe of Judah. Different ways of seeing things. Some of you know this story. A shoe salesman was sent to a remote part of the country. When he arrived, he was dismayed 
because everyone went around barefooted. So he wired the company. No prospects for sales. People don't wear shoes here. Make sense? Later, another salesman went to the same territory. He, too, immediately sent word to the home office, but his telegram read, Great potential. People don't wear shoes here. <laughs> right? Your perception in the situation. It was the same. One saw, oh, this is a disaster. There's no way. They, nobody wears them. Why are they going to wear them? The other guy goes, they don't wear them. We, we can just absolutely get this market. Hand over fist. Can you imagine? Right? That's the Caleb mindset. But how we perceive affects then how we proceed. So sometimes it will feel, what are the giants you're facing? Sometimes it feels like this. Sometimes it feels like this. Now that's up close and personal. I just, <laughs> I mean, just, I just like, but I like this little guy. He's in it, man. He's in it. Can't imagine having that much humanity underneath my. Okay. You know what? It's sometimes how it feels. And you got to sometimes go from here where you're just squaring off to where it gets up close and personal. Yeah? So what are the giants that you're dealing with? The culture right now, clearly this is one, right? I mean, it's just, and again, you got to see through the reports you got to discern what is. You don't live in denial. You do not live in denial. But you got to see through. And then sometimes we're just under some kind of oppression that just feels like assault. Could be finances, could be health, could be something the enemy's just stirring up. So it's always a question of context. Right now, I've got that against this backdrop. Do you see what this is? What is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So how are you seeing it? <laughs> or what about this? Pretty horrifying, right? Feels that way. But see, where's the focus? Sometimes you've got to back up like you did in those first slides and get the bigger picture. Because, see, he don't see what's behind him. One of the things I have fun, when, when I pray in the morning and I'm talking to Yeshua, you know, I just, I go through, I'm grateful for the various things that he did. And one of the things I'll talk about is thank you for laying your life down of your own accord. I talk about what he bore and everything. And that you went and raided hell in the grave and broke the bars and scared the snot out of him. I just think, boy, what a shock. <gasps> What? How you place your G this month? You're going to have to place a capital G. You can place it on the giant or you can place it on God. See what I'm saying? How's your God doing? And then how do you react to it? Yeah? I know they're sort of silly, but they get the point, right? I'm trying to imprint the idea because in the midst of that, you have to have the ability to see through the report and see the bigger context. What's the king say on this? Who are you? What is your life? Are you afraid of dying? Or do you understand what, what Paul said? Do you really get that to live is Christ, but to die is gain? You cannot win with someone who's convinced of that. You can't win against because it's like, either way, I'm good. I'm good. So, but this is also Caleb, right? Find and feed your inner dog. 
You have a difference. Say, I have a different spirit. Okay, put it, your hand here. Say, I have a different spirit. Okay. You know that, right? Paul says to Timothy, stir up the gifts. Okay? Stir up the gifts. You don't be in denial. You don't sit there, oh, it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. That's not, you're not a Christian scientist. Sorry, that's a mind over matter, right? It's just all this is illusion. That doesn't work. You have a different spirit. Do you see the dog now? Same graphic, okay? But pulled back, you gotta be able to see through it. Now, it's the framework is still there. And depending on what the enemy's doing, the enemy may not want you to see the people. Some of you thought it was a wolf. No, I've got it as a dog. Because this is about Caleb and your inner dog and all that. But here's some so what's for the month. How you perceive is how you proceed. What are you looking at? Any given moment, on the news, your finance, personally, health situation, whatever, what are you looking at? What's, what's your focus, right? Two, there are decisions before all of us. Don't miss what he's setting. Before you. I, I've run into people where it's like, well, I don't know that, you know, we're older, we're retired, we're whatever. Okay, you really think you're done? You really think there isn't something more? And what you got to know is when God sets it before you, it's more dangerous to stay than to go. It is far more dangerous because going back puts you into bondage. That'll kill you. Denial is not faith, it's delusion. Okay? We're clear on that. Do not be distracted. We have to be seeing the bigger picture. We have to be bold. We've got to be the Caleb's in the midst of everybody else with the sky falling. Remember, the cost to go back is always higher than moving forward. Be the dog. <laughs> Walk with a different spirit. And then in the midst of all that, be sustained by the comfort of the Father. You get this? Are you okay with this as the month and just a framework for things that God will show you? So remember, there are things to face, but remember that different spirit. You have a choice all the time, constantly throughout the day, to pick up and walk in another spirit that will be totally focused on the giants with a capital G or on the different spirit of Caleb that has the G, capital G on God, right? You're like ready to go home. We do want to take, receive grace though, right? Afresh. The bread and the wine. You good for that? It's too late and you got to go, you can go. But this is a means of grace. Okay. A couple of the comfort of the Father. But he was trush, crushed pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace, shalom, was on him and by his wounds we are healed. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and to live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Rebecca, Esther, would you come up and uh, Rebecca, I'm going to have you break the bread. Um, actually, why don't you just lift it up with one hand and pray over it. Lift it up with the plate. Thank you for what you gave. You gave us your son. And Jesus, we just thank you for your sacrifice. We 
thank you that you bore our sins. You took our iniquity. And that we are healed. We're healed by soul and spirit. Thank you for that exchange. So I'm going to have you raise that up to relay unto you, which was also given unto me, that our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he tore it. He broke it apart. He ripped it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take up the cup there. Father, we thank you that you sent your son. And Lord Jesus, you died on the cross and shed your blood. For us. And by your blood, we are cleansed and that we are healed. I just, we just lift this up before you in praise and adoration, this representation of what your blood tells us that we say yes to what you are saying and oh Lord we just bless you and praise you for the blood of the Lamb shed now for us that we might walk in life before you in Jesus name and so in like manner also after supper when he'd given thanks he took the cup and he gave it to them and he said take and drink all of this this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this and remember me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim again my death until I come again. Father, we receive this bread and wine as the new grace now for this month. The month of Av is a crazy month, but it's the fifth month, and that number five we know in Scripture is so often linked with grace, grace and more grace, Lord. So we just receive the raw grace we need to confront the enemy, to see the giants and not be afraid. We won't back down. We won't back up. We will see the opposition you set there as our bread. We won't be presumptuous. We understand this is as you delight in us, so we must stay linked in our hearts. But we'll advance into the promise that you've set before us. We will mix the promise with faith. We will choose to trust. And Lord, we just say, stir up in us that different spirit, that different mindset. that sees the bigness of the enemy and goes, yeah, more bread. Thank you that you will provide for us through the very thing that meant to oppose us. Just ask that you would seal these words. And Lord, now, I just release an impartation of the dog. <laughs> of Caleb, of Caleb. In the line of the lion of the tribe of Judah, we see Caleb. Lord, we just receive now, we receive an impartation to move in that kind of passion, that kind of vision, that kind of clarity. We will see through the report and we'll remember that you're God with a capital G and any giants are a small g to the glory of Jesus. Amen.